Ante todo, muchas gracias por la comunicación. Bienvenido al Z-Day de la República Argentina. Juan pregunta, mediante el código QR, ¿cómo ves el estado actual del movimiento Z y cuáles son los próximos pasos? So the first question is, how do you see the current state of the Saigai's movement and what are the next steps? That's a big question. The real question is what kind of projects can be developed by the community. So I don't look at the movement in any particular state, so to speak. I look at what people are doing. And I think the communicative efforts that we've done over the past 10 years have been very strong and have spread around the world and have had a lot of influence. But what's missing now is the development of new systems, something that in the past I've attempted to start, but in my own, you know, in my singular self, there's only so much I can do personally, at least right now. So things like the Global Redesign Institute, I've talked about that for years, uh, uh, getting people together to begin to show the world how, <clears throat> excuse me, new systems will work in a virtual environment building out cities, building out actual algorithms, and giving people the experience of living in a new society. This is something that, I, if I could you know, remove the complications of my life and focus on one particular thing and then get all the great thinkers and the movement behind it, this is what I would like to see. Continuamos con las preguntas que van llegando y Pedro pregunta a través del enlace si hay novedades sobre el siguiente trabajo. Peter, next question is coming from Peter, Pedro. And the question is, is there any news about your next job in two reflections? Uh, <laughs> except that it's been very, very difficult and has turned into a project that I should have known better to pursue based on the budget and the kind of work involved. Uh, this has been a multi-year torture, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a very solid communicative piece that hopefully will work on many levels. And then it's part, ideally, of three films, but I will not be approaching the other two films the same way because it has taken far too long uh, with the resources I have, very minimal resources I have when it comes to the kind of difficulty associated technically with the production. So. I'm doing my best. I, uh, I'm hoping within the next couple of months to get this done, but there are these things that come up, especially in my personal life, that keep sidelining me, and it, I won't go into all of that, but I'm, I'm doing my best. And then after that, I'm hoping to get back into more technical developments for the movement and beyond, because, I mean, this is only one small aspect of the communication process. To create a film is important, and to show things and to get people to change their values through the medium of art has always been very important to me. In combination, of course, with the lots of straight academic work, such as books that are written and so on. But uh, to answer your question, uh, I'm hoping in the next couple of months, but you have to be patient with me. It's been a very, very brutal process. Mariela pregunta, ¿cuál es la relación entre el Movimiento Z y tu nuevo libro the new human rights movement. Next question, Peter, is coming from Mariela. What is the relation between the movement, Psychist movement and your new book, the new human rights movement? Well, because both ideas are simply a train of thought, as I talk about in the video that was just run, there is a completely seamless combination. The efforts made communicatively have to have diversity. So, you know, the book, of course, is describing exactly what the movement has been talking about, but with more detail in terms of, you know, the, the finesse, I had more time to concentrate on certain areas that didn't, for example, make it into the movement book, the Zeitgeist Movement Defined. But the uh, train of thought is completely consistent. So whether it's called the New Human Rights Movement or excuse me, the fact that it's called the New Human Rights Movement is to give it a more generalized sense so people see that, yes, this is what we need. We need a new human rights movement of a completely different definition that is focused on changing the social system, not just focusing on this oppressed group here or you know, a civil rights issue over here in some country and so on. 
Same big picture phenomenon. Continuamos con la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Agustina pregunta si existe o ha existido algún ejemplo de una cultura sustentable. Y si es este el caso, ¿cuáles son las lecciones a aprender de estos ejemplos? This is a question from Agustina. The question is, is there exist or ever is there exist or ever existed any examples of sustainable culture? And if that's the case, What are the lessons learned in, from these examples? Uh, I referenced a few books in my prior book about writings regarding indigenous cultures, cultures that even after the Neolithic Revolution, even after the development of agriculture, which, as I've talked about at length, is what has created the systemic process of labor specialization, and then when you combine Uh, the ethic of income through that you end up perceiving scarcity and you begin to build out this problem that we see you know in the world today but there are exceptions especially native american cultures aboriginal cultures that you'll see spread throughout that have been isolated or i should say have been studied before they were wiped out usually uh, rainforest cultures that are still hunter-gatherer cultures they might seem strange to us But we have to ask ourselves what progress even, even is. If, if you could be happy living in an extremely minimalistic environment and have all of your measurements of health be higher than the Western world, and yet you live with no property, you live with community, that hunter-gather value system is inherently in harmony with the world because you can't really break away from it. You're contingent upon the natural processes of the environment and your value system adapts Hence, it's culturally sustainable. So those models are there, but unfortunately in our property culture, we see wealth and property, we see the value of you know, owning more things, and that sidelines people's understanding of that. But I always use those examples. And it's also, also why I always talk about the pre-Neolithic revolution, or excuse me, the pre-Neolithic period, because it's well established by anthropologists that these folks because they didn't engage in specialization and they existed in communities by default, they couldn't have property because they had to move around, they ultimately were in balance with nature. So that's the model I like to refer back to. Jeremías pregunta si usted, Peter Joseph, cree que el futuro político global será una democracia virtualizada, una nocracia o un gobierno articulado por la toma de decisiones de un sistema virtual global. Peter, next question is coming from Jeremias. The question is, do you think that the political future of a global level will be a virtualized democracy, a no, a nocracy, or a government articulated for the decision making in a virtual global system? Well, if I understand the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, it has to do with a more direct democracy through digital means. Is that correct? Yes. The, what okay. is your opinion about how the well, political uh, global system will be represented? I think that the regulatory necessity to keep things in balance with the economy is more important than the political concept we have today. So I would say that artificial intelligence, if used properly, will be able to set a, set a filter system that will be effectively the decision-making uh, engine that we contribute to, and it goes through our processes to decide what is the best route. It's not in control of things, but it's a filter system that says, well, humanity, you're going to have to follow these rules if you expect to be sustainable. And that basis, I think, will be the fundamental core of political decision making in the future, because the majority of political decision making today is this sort of higher, excuse me, it's this outcome of so much deficiency occurring economically. So once you get a handle on 
the scarcity problem and getting sustainable and distribution and getting equality out there, economic equality, which is desperately needed to, to affect people's psychology, to create less conflict. That's for another conversation. But once you have that taken care of, what we know of as politics today will be very, very different. And yes, to answer the question specifically, I believe the engagement will be on a very real level, sort of like an open source contribution to a software system like Linux, where people come into an institution, online most likely, and they're expressing what they think the world should be doing or their region should be doing. For example, I believe in localization. I think the future will be decentralized communities that are so efficient they're not reliant on the rest of the world to get imports and exports. And that will be a big part of it as well. So I could go on a long tangent about that, but the answer is in short, yes. That this kind of virtual synergy with AI will be what the future needs. And hopefully we can design something like that. Nos siguen llegando más preguntas a través del código QR. En este caso, ¿cómo podemos transmitir estas ideas a las clases obreras. This is a question from Madeline. Her, her question is, how can we transmit these ideas to the working class? Mm. You would think that the working class would be the most motivated by this kind of thinking, but it goes back to an educational problem I find. As many of you have witnessed in uh, the circus of the United States with our president and CEO, Donald J. Trump, his base is very much a large part, in part, the working class. They don't understand that he represents the nature of the capitalist system embodied, so they support him out of, you know, the understanding of his rhetoric. So, point being, education is critical, and the working class and the lower classes are the ones that really should be so motivated to change the system. They should be the ones that are, that are pushing as hard as they can, not just because of their own selfish you know, interests, but just because the, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to suffer the structural violence, their families are going to have to suffer the structural violence. It's a long conversation, but effectively education is the problem, and there's a reason why most of these countries, or most countries in general, have very poor education for the lower and middle class. It's not a conspiracy, but it's just a systemic consequence of what happens in a society that is so class divided. A feedback loop, they would call it in systems theory. A positive feedback loop that keeps the lower and middle classes unaware and effectively subservient to the value system of the upper classes. Germán pregunta, ¿qué opina sobre la renta básica universal? The question is coming from Germán. His question is, what do you think about universal basic income? I have always been in support of it ever since it was first talked about in the 1960s when I read about it being talked about in the 1960s by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It makes perfect sense that in an unequal society with great technological abundance that is being even more unequally distributed, that you have to have some kind of uh, income coming to those classes, those lower classes, because they're going to become unstable, first of all. And that leads me to the point that it's actually an elitist concept in a way because it creates complacency for the lower, pop, the lower classes because it is going to make it seem like the system is correcting, but the system isn't really correcting. The system is just compensating. And that goes for most of the welfare kind of reforms and, and economic uh, wealth redistribution schemes that we see, which I, again, am in support of because there's too much suffering. You, you have to you have to put something out there that helps people right now, especially with the rise of technological unemployment and automation. So all I would say is that there's a caveat to it that people need to be aware of, that it's not really a solution. It's just going to help give people more time, keep them healthier, and hopefully they can begin to study more. And those same people who eventually get this, because I do think it's going to happen, will be able to you know, learn and rise up eventually to, you know, really take hold and take this system down and bring in something that's truly humane. But I'm in favor of it. 
Daniel pregunta cómo cree que las clases altas privilegiadas van a reaccionar ante una eventual transición a una economía basada en recursos. Peter, this is going to be our last question. It's uh, the person asking is Daniel. Uh, after this question, uh, if you want to say anything else, of course you are welcome. Um, how do you think that the privileged classes will react in, in the case of an eventual transition to the resource-based economy? I would say history will show that answer. That, you know, the, the drive for more equality in general, and not just economic, but democratic, we've seen this rise of human rights and civil rights, you know, since the dawn that we've, of knowledge that's been recorded. Always has there been an insurgency of the lower classes trying to, you know, pull themselves out of destitution and effectively being stifled by the upper classes. So I think you just look to history to see that, and the same thing will happen. The only difference now is because of the rise of technology and efficiency, because there's such an incredible amount of um, capacity, so our ability to do so much more with less, I believe eventually that the upper classes that hold all the wealth and power are going to realize that they have to concede to that physical fact, meaning that they're going to compensate and they're going to know effectively that their power has to be preserved by allowing for these, um, these changes to occur. But that's just a small nuance of it. I frankly believe that eventually you're going to be able to circumvent power by localization. So just as a computer went from this giant outrageously expensive and power consuming edifice that was the you know the size of, of two giant rooms and now the chip in your cell phone is more powerful than that by many times if you think about industry that way if the focus is there we can do the same thing in our communities where the entire community industry becomes more and more localized and smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually you have a nation such as Argentina if if you know a small nation where you don't even need the power dynamic of globalization anymore you don't have to worry about the pressure coming from the global north to to manipulate your politics and to make sure they have access to your resources I think that if uh, the focus is there this will be really the transition point And eventually you're going to have a whole global distribution of centralized, excuse me, decentralized, but centralized in the sense that you have community. You're not importing, you know, strawberries from some other country. You're not sending food to China and back or sending materials to China and back for assembly. All of that can eventually go away through ephemeralization, as I've talked about before. And I think that will be the real way to uh, circumvent power. And then in the communities, it will be a community effort and at least in that case the problem of power will be far less because there's just no pressure anymore to have that that uh, to ping that tendency of dominance that has been so consistent especially when we alleviate fundamental scarcity un fuerte aplauso muchas gracias peter joseph desde los Estados Unidos de América, en vivo y en directo en el ZD, capítulo regional, capítulo global, todo el mundo reflejado aquí en este ZD desde el Centro Cultural San Martín.